1938 you came here. Yeah. Does it uh, look very different in 1968? Mm, not at all. In point of fact, there seems to be no change outside at all. Some paintings being repaintings have been done. I rather over like the canteen, yeah. like the colour of the canteen. Over here we used to park our cars and one of our status symbols, one of the leading status symbols, to have your name, you know, over a section where you could lodge your car. You know, I miss it today. Here, of course, we've got the canteen here and we had the separate room with the round table where we had our conferences and we were, sometimes we'd have our lunch there. It was in uh, Basil Dean's days, it was known as the Deanery. The Reg Baker is the bakery. In my days, as the, the balcony. <laughs> and it's, I think, the table. The table is not the same. We had a lovely, lovely round table, big round table. Mm. That seems to go. We probably flogged it, I don't know, before you, uh, before you came. Yes, and... Uh, Anything else you can see that's no, different or the no, same? No, or? no, not at all. No, no, we had a... No, no, not in this part of the, uh, the mm. walk, anyway. There's a different chair. I don't know what that, that used to be a supplementary studio where we took tests. We wasn't big enough to put any, any large sets in. We're very good as a testing studio. Now it seems to be put to rather more ministry tests, is it? I'm not sure. This is film training. Film training, good, good. I'm all for that. There's not <laughs> enough of it today. <laughs> Oddly enough, most of the training that is being done is being done by the BBC, you know, which is a jolly good thing. You know, some fine, fine films coming out of the, out of the British Broadcasting Corporation. Because when I first came, this back studio wasn't built. Uh, uh, we needed a, a, a place, what, uh, you know, extra accommodation, so we built that some years later. Mm. I don't know, is it, uh, is it soundproof now? If we didn't do much actual uh, production there, you know, no. a lot of it was a lot of it, so extra scenes and... Can you remember the last time you worked? It's the last time, I think, was sure it was the Lady Killers, where we had a street scene, I, I think, uh, uh, built here. Was it? Yes, sure. I'm almost sure it was the yeah. Lady Killers. It's, yeah. hard, it's hard to remember. Of course, we used to sort of re, uh, uh, recondition them for different things. I think it was the Lady Killers. Mm. But, I mean, you didn't, in fact, do an awful lot. Uh, on the lot, did you, uh, when, when you were making films? No, not an awful lot, but it was very useful to set, yeah. uh, you know, if we could use it for a number of films. Yeah. Yeah. Not a great deal. We liked working on actual locations as far as we possibly could. Yeah. This section around here is presumably mainly where the studio is. Yes, yeah. the main studio block. We had three stages in this block. Uh, uh, one large stage, and the other, there were two stages uh, next door to it. So we have operated here uh, three stages all together. And with the shops opposite, I don't know if it's the same now, we used to have our carpenter shop immediately opposite the stage, so as far as possible the sets could be moved over uh, over here. I don't know if it operates that way now, but that certainly was the carpenter shop here, the three main stages here. Well, let's have a look and see what they're doing here today. Yeah, yeah. And all absolutely free to the end. All right, it's a phone off. Yeah. Yes. OK, very quiet, gentlemen everywhere, please. Upstairs as well. Thank you. All right, Jim. Ready, Frank? Mm-hmm. Turn over. Running. Parker. Nine, take one. Hello again. Today. Snibbo announces a new wonderful free gift offer. Just send in your Snibbo free gift voucher and you will receive a choice of clip-on eyelashes, dummy ears, adjustable cardboard foreheads, Union Jack wigs, kneecap covers in six exciting shades, alabaster solder cases and zinc stick-on dimples, and all absolutely free with a two and sixpenny postal order. Vouchers from three cans of Snibbo bring you our special offer, a six hour multi-Snibbo mud bath. For this, real river mud is used and not a chemical imitation. Here are a few testimonials received even before
So, uh, this was your office? Oh, yes. Is it very different? No, not a great deal. It's exactly the same as far as the panelling is concerned, except for this one wall where the panelling was extended. There was a door through to my secretary's office. And uh, Diane obviously wasn't here. No, it wasn't for that. I'm on my own and it's rather sparsely furnished because I like the desk back to the window so that I could see the people coming through mm. the door of there. So, so, was... so th this obviously wasn't your desk? No, no, no. Mine was over there. A different desk. I don't know what happened to mine. This is not. Uh, this is not. Now, you came to Ealing in 1938, but how did the studios start? Oh, they'd started four or five years earlier with Basil Dean. Basil Dean teamed up with an old colleague of mine called Baker, and they had the support of Sir Stephen Courthold, who was then Mr. Stephen Courthold, and they built these studios and made a series of George Formby pictures here, and a series of pictures with Gracie Fields before I arrived. I carried on with the Formby series for a time, but they'd established a, a reputation for comedy of that type. Mm. Uh, 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 I... uh, when you came in 1938, and you say they'd already established a, a reputation of comedy, uh, for comedy of that kind, what were your immediate aims? What, what policy did you have? Well, I, you, you must remember I'd been a, in active production uh, since 1920 and had worked and had founded Gainsborough, and then had worked at going on British at Shepherd's Bush at Lime Grove. And obviously one had learned to work with a number of creative people that uh, I cared about and who I could, uh, work, you know, who could work with easily. And I brought a number of them here, uh, deciding if I could, to make films without pressures of any sort, to make the sort of films that we wanted to make. Ealing became a kind of forcing ground for directors, because I think none of your directors had ever directed before they came to you, had they? No, they were all. In, there was only one case in the whole time I was here of, the imp of importing an outside director, and that was Sorrel Dickinson for whom I have a very high regard, and he came to us during the war uh, to direct Next of Kin. And then later on, he made another film with us, Secret People, but there were no other cases. Every director came from, mm. the, from the staff. So really, the, the main uh, point about eating students, I suppose, could be summed up in team spirit? Yes, yes. I wonder if I might say a little more about that. See, it's awfully hard to rationalize uh, the idea behind the studios, but I think we all came here convinced that films you know, made in this country should be really from, you know, from the roots, you know, right down in the soil, it should be absolutely indigenous British films. Mm. That was the, the, uh, the, the real idea behind it. It sounds, it sounds chauvinistic. I don't think, not, not intended to be, because, but I do happen to think that the only sort of nationalism that's worth a damn is cultural nationalism. And I think that should apply to films. We want them to be absolutely rooted in the soil of this country. Now, I don't suppose we said those very words to each other. But I think that was possibly the idea that was behind our mind. Certainly was behind mine. We were very much influenced by the documentary movement, which I still think is one of the most important influences in, in this country. Mm. Cavalcanti was a great documentary man. Many of the other men I've mentioned had some documentary training. And yes, we wanted uh, to, to tell films in visual terms. Basically, many of them, basically, we all believed, you see, that, that Films should be designed for the film medium. See, indeed, we had to borrow from, sometimes from a well-known novel, even from a play sometimes, although I don't think play material is very good. But basically, our best films started with a blank sheet of paper and an idea. 
The originals? Yes. Mm. Now, why did you decide to go for comedy? Well, I think uh, it was a sort of reaction after the war, you know. We uh, had just emerged victoriously from war, you know, and, uh, you know, to make a, a land fit for heroes to, to live in, and we thought it was a, a sort of celebration, I think, you know, the age of cynicism. It didn't follow f until some years later. In any case, we didn't depart entirely from our, uh, 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 from realism, because if I might mention, you know, just to point the, uh, to point the argument here, I would, if I can mention Chaplin, Chap Chaplin's type of co uh, comedy is to play against a cloud cuckoo background. But all the Ely comedies were played against realistic backgrounds. They were odd people odd human beings, we all know, playing against very realistic backgrounds. And mm. So it wasn't such a, a, a big departure as one, might have, uh, as one might think. But generally speaking, were you out for laughs or, were you, or did you see yourself in the role of satirist? Well, commentators rather than satirists. I think satirists became, satire became fashionable didn't it, a little later. I think, yes, it was a sort of revolt against the regimentation of the time. You know, if, you, mm. if you think of films like Passport to Pimlico and uh, uh, Lavender Hill Mob, you see, it was sort of mild anarchy, if you like, mm. that uh, we thought it was, uh, you know, time to indulge ourselves a little. You did at one time admit that Ealing and sex were strangers. Now, would it be fair to say that there's a slightly Puritan streak in you, or there was at the time you were working here? I think it would be fair to say it, yes. <laughs> I, I think it would be fair to say it, uh, yes. I don't know, we were not. It is, surely enough, we were not terribly good at, uh, uh, at films dealing with sex. No, we weren't. You know, we were... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, think it's, I think it's fair comment. I don't know if it is. But you, but you don't think your work suffered because of this? May have done, you see. Yeah, it may have done, although we had... Uh, 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 a fairly high reputation. I'm not going to say that it couldn't have been better, you know, but I don't seem to have, uh, you know, to have uh, either found the stories or the people at that time mm. who were, uh, they weren't interested in sex, they might be interested in sex, but not in terms of film. You know. it's, uh, it's just one of those things. You know. mm. I'd like to talk to you a little, if I may, about um, the distribution of your films, because at Ealing, you use ranks distribution. Yeah. So, in a way, you were a dominion in ranks empire. Now, did this bother you at the time? Well, in point of fact, there were various stages. When I first came here, we distributed our own films. We then went to uh, United Artists during the war. After the war, we came to the conclusion that uh, it wasn't a viable proposition to, uh, to, to do our own distribution. We hadn't a, a sufficient number. And, as you know, uh, the structure of the industry was alter altering. It was getting itself into main groups, owning theatres. Mm. And there were difficulties in regards to the distribution of British films, unless you had some alliance or working arrangement one of the big companies. And although I'd always been against the tendency towards monopoly, and indeed am to this day, we did decide that it would be a good thing to work in an alliance with them. But as the years went on, by virtue of changes that were taking place in the industry, it seemed difficult to maintain that independence that we had won. Mm. And this is a subject which still occupies quite a bit of your time. Oh, yes. Mind you, after we finished our rank distribution arrangements, we did for a time uh, uh, have our films sold by Metro Goldwyn Mayer of America. And when we left Ealing Studios, we transferred to the MDM studios at Elstree, Street, where we worked for a year or two. Mm. But I wasn't very happy in an association with a large American company. And that is the time 
we decided to sell the Ealing Company. We'd already sold the studios to the British Broadcasting Corporation. We then decided to sell the whole company to Associated British Picture Corporation. Then there was a period, of course, uh, when I helped to organize. At that point, I was then getting on in years and had to debate in my mind whether I was going to retire or not. I didn't retire, but helped to organize a cooperative production venture known as Bryanston Films. And that was the company that financed the early films of Woodfall, which included Saturday Night's Sunday Morning, Taste of Honey, The Entertainer, and all that really rather remarkable group of films. Now, I wasn't playing an active part in the production of those films, but I was helping them to get launched. Of course, by bringing you back here to your office, I'm implying a good deal of nostalgia. But in fact, of course, you moved on and you're still an independent producer. But you haven't, in fact, made a film for some years. Are you likely, do you think, to be tempted by a good subject? Oh, I think if I was passionately interested in a subject, I could hardly uh, you know, stop making it. On the other hand, when you reach a certain time and have activities connected with the industry without necessarily making films, you have to think very hard as to whether you will devote, say, a year or more of your life to uh, making a film, you know, and it would have to be something very exceptional indeed. You know, I might find it, I don't know, I don't know.